Hello, I'm Pastor Marilyn from Forsyth Presbyterian Church and Newkirk Campus Ministry at Mercer University. And I'm Pastor Joseph from Culpeper Presbyterian Church. Welcome to our Lenten Sermon and Discussion Series on the Story of Joseph, found in Genesis chapters 37 through 50. Pastor Marilyn and I are using the Common English Bible and New Revised Standard Version for this series, and our references will be taken from those translations. You, however, are welcome to use any translation you like. Uh, comparing different translations is a great way to gr gain greater insight into Scripture. Pastor Marilyn and I will start the discussion, and then y'all will take over in your small groups or in the comments section of these videos. Last time, we worked our way through Genesis 42 and 43, which begin a new section of the Joseph novella. In that section, the brothers go down to Egypt to buy grain, unknowingly meet that long-lost brother Joseph, and are sent away until they can bring back Benjamin, having to leave Simeon behind in prison. After a delay due to Jacob's unwillingness to risk Benjamin, the brothers return and share a meal together, but only Joseph knows what's really going on. We talked about the complicated relationships within Jacob's family, as his children have reached adulthood and have had children of their own. Jacob's grief makes him ineffective as head of the household, and Reuben continues to be unimpressive. Judah, however, shows maturity and assumes responsibility for the family that Jacob and Reuben have seemed unable to bear. We also talked about Joseph's tears, how he weeps three times as he is reunited with his brothers. Pastor Joseph's perspective was that the first was an unexpected flood of unresolved trauma with which biblical Joseph is finally beginning to deal. The second and more intense cry comes when Joseph sees his beloved baby brother, Benjamin, the only other child of their mother, Rachel. Although at the end of chapter 43, the brothers have passed two of Joseph's tests and all 12 sons of Israel break bread together, Joseph still needs to divine if their hearts are truly changed and if they hate and will betray Benjamin over the same favoritism that once belonged to Joseph. Biblical scholar, Dr. Kathleen O'Connor explains, rather than being deliberately cruel or caring only about his father and brother, I think Joseph is a clever strategist who learned to protect himself from further abuse and disappointment. He needs to find out whether his murderous brothers have changed. And so he designs a test that recreates parallel cruelties that they imposed on him in their common past. Enter the silver cup of divination, stowed by the steward in Benjamin's pack. While much has been made of the significance of this drinking vessel, and whether Joseph used it as the magicians of Egypt might have, we agree with Dr. O'Connor, who succinctly states, Joseph's silver cup of divination functions as a literary device through which he defines or discerns the true hearts of the brothers. While the brothers indignantly meet the accusation of theft with rash promises of death and enslavement should it be found in their possession, Joseph Stewards speaking Joseph Steward speaking for Joseph carefully words his response, saying, He with whom it is found shall become my slave, but the rest of you shall go free. When the search uncovers the cup in Benjamin's possession, the steward's words give the brothers the opportunity to cut and run. Joseph carefully calibrates his test so that if the brothers fail it, Benjamin will find himself safe with his full brother in Egypt and out of the clutches of the brothers who functionally murdered Joseph in that empty cistern in Dothan. Yet unlike 20 years ago, Jacob's older sons are not willing to abandon a brother and bereave their father. Judah launches into a critical defense of Benjamin, where he reveals to Zaphonath the Egyptian that all the family drama that has happened, speaking passionately of the grief of their father over the son, surely torn to pieces, and explaining that Benjamin is the key to everything for their family. Biblical scholar Dr. Walter Brueggemann explains, because the brothers could not believe the dream, they're forced to treat Father Jacob as though he were the last generation who must be kept alive and unharmed for perpetuity. They cannot see themselves as a generation of promise bearers. They are unable to think 
of any generation after themselves. Meanwhile, Joseph was so focused on the threat of his brothers that he forgot to account for the love of his father. Grief, guilt, and trauma have threatened the survival of Israel's family in the face of famine and the survival of the family's faith. But all is not lost. Judah concludes his plea by offering to take Benjamin's place as the Egyptian potentate's slave. And in this self-sacrificial offer, Joseph divines that this is not the same man who sold his younger brother for 20 pieces of silver 20 years ago. When Joseph hears this spirited defense of his beloved baby brother, Benjamin, who really isn't a baby anymore, he weeps for the third and most intense time. Even though he sent everyone away from him, everyone overhears his tears and he declares, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? As the tears fall from his eyes, the scales fall from theirs. Zaphonath is Joseph again. The brothers cannot respond because they are terrified of Joseph. And so Joseph moves towards them, literally and emotionally, and offers them a provisional reconciliation. They still have work to do, but the process has begun as they are sent to return to their father. And for more on that reconciliation, take a look at our sermons from March 27th. Much of our focus as we've undertaken this Lenten journey has been on how this is the story of a family. Right from the start, scripture defines this novella as the account of Jacob's descendants. Now, after years of being physically removed from one another, the family will be all together in one place, the land of Goshen. It is, however, much easier to bridge physical distance than it is emotional distance. After all, Joseph had spent significant time in close proximity with his brothers in earlier chapters, but the emotional divide remained until Joseph could divine the character and the intentions of his brothers. The brothers' repentance of their previous violence and protectiveness toward Benjamin means that this broken family can begin to be bound back together. With the invitation to reside with one another, they can also work on living with one another. Having begun the process of reconciliation with Joseph, the brothers must now return to Jacob and begin their reconciliation with their father. For the very act of telling Jacob that Joseph is alive and all his words, will require the brothers to disclose their part in Joseph's original expulsion from the family. Grief, guilt, and lies have controlled the family dynamics in Canaan for decades, bringing them to the brink of annihilation. Tension between the generations and a tug of war over Benjamin forced Jacob to relinquish control of the situation leaving space for God's providence to open up a new future for the whole family. Joseph's interpretive work over these events of the previous two decades, which he gives in his self-revealing speech to his brothers, moves this whole narrative from a secular story to theological testimony. And now in a new place, roles and responsibilities within the family shift significantly. The unimpressive Reuben is relieved of the pressure and responsibility of the firstborn. Judah, through his offer of self-sacrifice, takes on that role. Jacob, once the provider and protector of the family, is able to retire and play with his grandkids. Joseph now provides for the family. And this family has been through its breaking and remaking and moves on to a new future that God has provided for them. The emigration of the house of Israel, 70 persons in all, including Joseph and his family who are already in Egypt. This immigration from Canaan to Egypt to Goshen specifically is covered in chapter 46. And while this passage is God breathed and useful for all those things in 2 Timothy 3.16, it's not essential for our discussion. We commend it to your reading and personal discipleship but we aren't going to discuss it at length here. Next time, 
We're going to take a look at the stages of Jacob's life and how his ending becomes a new beginning for the family of Israel. We are going to pass things off to y'all's discussion groups now or to your individual reflections so that this conversation can continue. We study scripture together so that we get a fuller picture of what God is doing in the text and what God is doing in the whole world around us. We're entering this story to, together to grow as disciples. So we encourage you not to think of this as a source of definitive answers, but as a starting point for your own exploration. And so we encourage you to share any questions you may have, both with us and with one another.